Tanse Anin, and hello. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, your favorite cousin. <laughs> and I'm here to take the land back. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Not enough Cree in the room yet. I'm Swambi Cree from the Yopipana Piyu and Cree Nation in uh, northern Manitoba. That's in Treaty 5 territory but I've called uh, Winnipeg home for just over 20 years, the last five in my favorite found home of the North End, in the heart of Winnipeg, the heart of the continent, Manitoba, Manitowapo, where the Creator sits. I want to acknowledge, of course, Treaty One territory and the Métis homeland and all my relatives and my relations here in the room. And this place is really special to me, this place we call Winnipeg. My poetic voice was found here. My media journey began here. I found family here. I created family here. I became so much in this space. I'm a poet, a broadcaster. I'm a mother, and I am a witness. But this is not the story I'm sharing with you today. In this story, I am a cover girl. In February of 2014, I was on the cover of a magazine. No, not the cover of the Rolling Stone, because that would be awesome. <laughs> no, I was on the cover of a national news magazine. There beside a headline that screamed, Race Problem Ugliest in Winnipeg. Special report. There, stoic and angry, a dramatic head and shoulders shot on a black background. There, beside my unsmiling and stoic face, in 36-point white font, they call me a stupid squaw. You may have seen it. When I first saw it, I was pretty stunned. I think my reaction went something like, oh, fa beep. Perhaps a little dramatic. Who doesn't want to be on a magazine cover? Well, me. I work in radio, people. And certainly not like this. It was a bit of a shock because no one told me I was going to be on the cover. I saw it on Twitter, and that's how I found out. And yes, I know, I agreed to the article, to, to the interview, and I agreed to be photographed as a member of the media. I certainly know that the most productive, the most provocative images and words sell the most magazines. But I was just one small story of many in the article, two lines to be exact. I thought there are more important stories to be told. Tina Fontaine, Michael Champagne, the Bannock Lady, the continuing challenges that our people face every single day. But there I was, racism's cover girl. Okay, I thought. Don't panic. Who reads magazines anyways, except those people who sit in doctor's offices and have to go to the bathroom a lot? Maybe it won't be so bad. Well, within hours, it was all over my social media. People were liking it and sharing it and thumbs upping all over the place. And hey, girl, way to go. The media was gathering a reaction from everyone and anyone. My inbox slowly filled with interview requests. Okay, that's not too bad. I can deal with that. Then the next day, the mayor of Winnipeg held a press conference. Invited everyone. Well, except me. He stood shoulder to shoulder with indigenous leaders, with community, with allies, and said, we are going to confront this, this ugly racism. We're going to deal with it. I mean, the mayor cried, guys. He cried. It was a big deal. And the debate burned on, from local radio to national news, online, offline, in line, at coffee shops, and around tables, and in pubs every day for weeks. My own mother was like, you're on the news again, and would change the channel. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. And I just wanted to withdraw. I refused all media requests. I didn't engage in social media. I didn't explain, argue, deny, or confirm what that bold title labeled me as. I was happy to let it be, to let it run out as all things do in media. 
And it's not that I disagreed or disliked the article or its contents, per se. Yes, there is racism in Winnipeg. Shocking. And yes, I still get called that name. But the place described in those pages was not what I knew as home. And the face on that cover was not someone I recognized. This was not my story. I have two girls. They are 10 and almost 12. And they are my sun and my moon. My girls know who they are. I take them to powwows, protests, round dances, and rallies. They know the story imprinted on their bones, the story that's written on their skins. And at the time, my younger was eight. She goes to a large multicultural school and has a lot of friends. She loves art and music, and she really is proud of her culture, her Anishinaabe and Cree culture. About a week after the article hit, my little girl came home from school, and she was very quiet, and that's not normal for her. So I said, baby, what's wrong? And she said, mama, today at school, the kids are talking about that article. They said, you're wrong. She said, a boy called me a dirty Indian today. She said, that's why we're brown, because we're dirty. And there it was, that punch in the gut, that loss of breath, that loss of words that you expect but never are prepared for. As much as I tried to avoid this story, there it was sitting across from me at my supper table. There it was. It had become her story. So I had a choice. I could continue to say that this is not my story and ignore it and hope it goes away. Or I could change the conversation. I had to recognize my power, in fact, my responsibility as a storyteller, as a member of this community, as a mother, and as a witness, to stand in this space and to tell the story. And because I am not your squaw, I took back my narrative. I have this awesome job as a host of a radio show, you might have heard it, CBC is unreserved. And I have an amazing supportive team who allowed me to use that radio space for my own personal use. <laughs> Using my own words and based in my own experience, I was able to offer reaction to the piece. I was able to share a little bit of my story. I allowed one camera to tape it and for them to use in their news, and that's all the media did on the cover. Because the conversation had become so much bigger, and because not everyone has a radio show, Rosanna, I also made space so the community could share their narrative. With the help of some amazing women, we created the Race to Peace Project. Uh, those were a series of public dinner and discussions about race relations right here in our city. Everyday people facing everyday people in an open and honest conversation, much like the walrus does. We came together to talk, to listen, and to learn. And we learned that yes, Winnipeg is a divided place. Divided by her train tracks that stitch together north and south, by rivers that bring us together and drift us apart. There is a social divide, a race divide, and for some, a denial divide that threatens to drown us if we cannot stand together, hold together, and bridge that divide. But so too does this heart beat strong and open. We are more than just poverty porn and st sad statistics. Winnipeg has been the place of trade and treaty making. It is a boom and bust place. It had rebellion and round dance revolutions. In my culture, we look to the circle for much of our teachings. 
It teaches us unity, strength. There is always room in the circle. It is where no one leads and everyone leads. We are all equal in the circle. And it can only made, be made stronger the more people you add. And so I invite you in. Come on in and let's share in all of our stories. I go say.